COVID shot. Correct. Yeah, I am too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't hear, Katie. Did you? <clears throat> Most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for another day that we can come and study your word. We thank you that your word is alive, dear Lord. And by reading it and ingesting it and studying it, that it becomes um, alive in our lives. And I thank you and praise you for that. I thank you for the way that you show us your love each and every day. And I thank you for this group of ladies, this group of friends that... Um, I am blessed to call friends and I just thank you for the group of them and what they have to share to the discussion each and every week. I pray you um, <clears throat> lead and guide in our discussion today, dear Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds and our hearts so that we would, um, we would know what you would have us to learn from today's study. I pray these things in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. So we're going to do Proverbs 25, which is King Hezekiah, which I love. I have a slight obsession with King Hezekiah. So um, it was like a no-brainer to do one of his um, on here, but I had, I had to pick which one. So that was that was the hard part. So uh, verses 1 through 5, Stacey, if you don't mind reading those. Yeah. More Proverbs of Solomon. There are more Proverbs of Solomon compiled by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search out a matter is the glory of kings. As the heavens are high and the earth is deep, so the heart of kings are unsearchable. Remove the cross, remove the dross from the silver, and a silversmith can produce a vessel. Remove wicked officials from the king's presence, and his throne will be established through righteousness. Yeah, so <laughs> verse one, the Proverbs in chapter 25 through 29 were collected by the men of King Hezekiah, who was um, a godly king until late in life. He had his issues, but um, we do see that he returned back to Christ, so, our God. So, um, but I think about this, think about the men Hezekiah surrounded himself with. Um, certain persons appointed by Hezekiah for that work, whether were prophets Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, who lived in his day or some others, um, it is neither evident nor material. Like, so we see here that Isaiah definitely prophesied that he was like with King Hezekiah all the time. So you have to see, like he was based, the way I looked at it, like reading scripture and stuff. And we'll see that going through Isaiah at the end of the, after we're going to get into Isaiah pretty soon here. We're going to see that he, Isaiah prophesied to Hezekiah a lot and Hezekiah had to, um, definitely uh hear some hard words from him but that's who hezekiah surrounded himself with so i i don't know to me that like you see in proverbs that who you hang out with is who you become and and everything and so we see that with hezekiah and that's why i feel like he was such a godly king um and even after hezekiah said we saw that that isaiah came to him and said you're gonna die because of what you did you know i mean like you sinned and um hezekiah repented um, and God gave him more years, um, because of that. So verse two to three, both God and Kings are unfathomably their respective subjects cannot entirely comprehend their knowledge and motives. A matter may include science and creation, philosophy and personal motives and legal testimony. God is glorious because his creation is so intrinsic. Kings gain glory by delving into things that improve their ability to rule, isn't this cool to think about? People get their PhDs in one of these subjects. So if you think about all of these subjects that my Bible notes had, had mentioned, but even if you knew all there is to know, like you can have somebody who knows everything about philosophy. You can have somebody who knows everything about science. Um, I was actually listening to an interview yesterday with um, the guy who did the creation museum and, um, and everything. He's very intelligent. And, but he, I mean, and so it's really cool to listen to, his, his take on things, because he has that certain thing that he is good at. He, he has studied through his whole life. Um, but even if you try to know everything, and, and Solomon knew it, he had the gift of wisdom. But here, they the subjects, but even if you knew all there is to know about one thing, you do not even have a glimpse of the greatness of creation. Like that is so fascinating to me, um, just to think about. And there are many mi mysteries in the universe, both material and spiritual mysteries. There are many things God has concealed, and this is one expression of his glory. It is one of God's ways to say, you are amazed by what you see, yet what you don't see, what I have concealed, is even greater. 
Um, that is, I don't know, that is just so, pro like, we think what we see is beautiful, but heaven is going to be so much more beautiful. Like, that's the thing. It's like, um, and it's awesome if you think about all these people who think that they know everything there is to know about a subject. And God is like, I only let you know what I let you know, bud. Like, there is so much more. And so it's like, and that's a cool thing because we're never, we can never stop learning too. So there's like the flip of that. We can always learn more. Um, and, and I think that that's why it's so important to be in God's word, right? It's so important to stay in God's word because he's going to teach us more and more about his word. I mean, I think of myself when I became a Christian 24, 23 years ago, um, I didn't know anything. Like I had no idea. I just remember one time somebody was talking about, um, what was it there? That I can't remember a song and I was like what does that even mean and it was like it was like a, a fundamental Christian thing but I had no idea what it like what it meant and um you know and I had to ask somebody like what does that even mean and they were like you don't know what that means and I was like no I don't like I, I don't know the bible I never read the bible you know I mean I had just became a believer um and so it's just like these things now looking, looking now, I'm like, I love these stories. Like these are my, this is my family. It's like, it's like one day I'm going to see all of my family whenever I get to heaven. Like I'm going to see King Hezekiah and I'm going to see Daniel and I'm going to see Jesus, of course. And it's going to be amazing. Um, it's becomes, uh, it's just amazing. Like that's why I think being in God's word is so important. Um, and that's why I do think that just digging into his word is so important. Okay. So what I see amazes me, but God has concealed even greater treasures of knowledge and wisdom in his creation. Romans 1 19. Did I put that in there? I may have just, okay. Romans 1 19 through 20. Um, it says that, and I must not like, this is a quote from, from, uh, AG or sorry, G Campbell Morgan. I must not arrogantly think that I can figure it all out. This is the principle of all the triumphs of scientific investigation. It is the deepest secret of all advance and spiritual strength. Um, it is crazy because we just watched this movie. It's called The Investigator. It's based on a true story, which is crazy. I'm not going to tell you whose brother it is. It's actually a famous actor's brother. Um, <clears throat> but he lost his faith because his wife had had a miscarriage. And he lost his job all in the same day. And um, and he was a cop for 20 years and he lost his job. And as they were telling him to retire, the, the hospital called and his wife was having a miscarriage and she was for, far along. Um, and he just lost all, he lost his, he turned from God. He said, why would God allow this to happen? And then he ended up becoming a teacher and um, he basically put God on trial to see if it, God really happened. And so it was, it's a really good, it's a really good movie. Um, but that's basically what he did here. He had an investigation, like, is God real? His students said, do you believe? And it was, he was teaching at a Christian school and he couldn't answer it. He said, okay, get to like, we're, let's go eat lunch. He'd always invert the question. Um, but in that it was, it was really cool. Um, and how he used being a cop, he, he brought the people from the tab, from his force in and ask questions. So it was really, really, I would highly recommend that movie. Um, okay, so verses four and five, the impurities or dross had to be removed in a crucible to provide the silversmith's pure silver adequate for making something useful. The people in the king's presence and his service, officials and advisors for a throne to be established suggests at least uncontested rule and possibly a dynasty. Um, so you cannot have a pure silver vessel till you have a purified have you until you have purified the silver. And no nation can have a king, a public blessing till the wicked, all bad counselors, wicked and interested ministers and slanders are banished from the court and cabinet. Could you imagine if this happened for real, for real? Like what if people, what if everyone, I just think of like even everywhere in the world, like there's one country I've been to. If you say anything negative about the king, you go to jail. You just you're in, you're in jail. Like like in public, um, the king that had, that was in place was an excellent king. So no one ever said anything bad about him, but he had passed away. And when we were there, they were in the year of mourning and the sun had taken over and the sun was really, really bad. And, but no one could say it like everyone would kind of. And so, so somebody had said, yeah, just don't talk about it. He's really bad because the king before him was like for the people and the king, the son who took over was just for the son. And so it was just kind of crazy. Um, so I just, I just kept on thinking about this. Like, what if, 
the people who are in, in power, what if they surrendered to Christ? What if, what if the Bible was the guide? What if that were to happen? We would see a revival and that would be amazing. Um, and so it's just, but there is hope. We can pray for that. We can pray for a revival. So I just think of that. Um, even, even then, you know, we had, we looked at the Kings and old Testament last year and we went through it. It was like what 70% were bad and 30% were good, you know, um, when they ruled. And so we see like, there is nothing new under the sun as Ecclesiastes says. So, okay. Does anybody have anything on that section? That was a lot in there. only thing that I thought about when it talked about in verse two, um, it's the glory of God to conceal things, but the glory of kings is to search things out. I mean, that was part of the ideal kingship that God had set up was that the kings are supposed to constantly be learning the scripture. They were supposed to have it all memorized. And, um, and that's where their wisdom is supposed to come from. Right. <laughs> um, and it's an ideal that I think, God wants us to work on too, not that we're going to be leaders per se, but that we are going to continue to be in his word and um, search out his wisdom instead of the world. Yeah, I agree. And I think of also like the refining of the silver that is said in the notes, um, in my notes, you know, he refines us and, you know, that's what sanctification is. It's refining us. It's putting us through that to sanctify us. It's such a Christianese word, but, um, it really is. It's, that's what he does. And that's what we're called to do. Go through that. But yeah, I agree. Laura. Anybody else have anything? Along the same lines as the silver. <clears throat> it's so hard to remember that when you're going through those trials that it's it's for our benefit. I mean, you can see it in silver and you're like, oh yeah, it has to be pure. And that's why they have to put it through the fire. And, you know, but when, when we attribute it to our lives, it's just so hard when you're going through that to, to look at it from a place of being refined and not from a place of why is this happening to me or why, or how long do I have to go through this till I get the other side or, you know, I just, I, I'm speaking to the choir here because I, I so need to just almost relish in those, in those trials, because that's, you know, they're there for my betterment, but it's so hard to see it that way. Yeah. It's like James consider a joy when the trials are called upon you. Yeah. It's like one of the wacky channels that I enjoy watching is about a mine that's here in California. And, um, when you talk about refining silver, they went through that entire process. And now when I read this, it makes so much more sense because it takes just literal, just buckets and buckets and buckets full of these huge pieces of rock that then get refined and refined and refined and refined. And then, oh, look, you get maybe less than like the chapstick cap if that's generous of silver. So like this whole analogy of being refined, oh, okay, well, these giant boulders are all the things that happen that aren't super rad, but then that little teeny tiny piece of silver is what you get. Okay, that's great. And now it all makes sense to where it's like, it just feels like you're in, sometimes in life, you're in these unending seasons of, okay, why do you keep refining me? And then you finally get to that point where, oh, this is the silver moment. This is the silver lining. This is, you know, so yeah, like I said, when I read this, I can still see Brent from this little gentleman that bought the mine kind of going through this whole process. And he was all excited thinking, oh, we're going to get so much. And he's, cause he's got all these, you know, rocks and he goes and refines it. And he's like, I can make a coin. <laughs> you know, he was all excited about a coin, but that seeing that, reading that now it's like now I get why they use that parallel <coughs> very cool okay let's get to the next section okay. um Stacy while you're on so can you read verses six through twelve six through twelve okay do not exalt yourself in the king's presence and do not claim a place among his great men 
It is better for him to say to you, come up here, than for him to humiliate you before his nobles. What you have seen with your eyes, do not bring hastily to court, for what will you do in the end if your neighbor puts you to shame? If you take your neighbor to court, do not betray another's confidence, or the one who hears it may shame you, and the charge against you will stand. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a, right, a ruling rightly given. Like, e like an earring of gold or an ornament of fine gold is the rebuke of a wise judge to a listening ear. Okay, so verses six and seven, prideful self-promotion is not wise. There may have been a speci speci specified order in which these officials were supposed to stand before the king to stand in someone else's place would be pretentious. A noble... Or sorry, it is impossible, or sorry, it is possible that the last few words go with the next verse, which means this, that which your eyes have seen, do not be hasty to take to court. Um, so verse six and seven, this is thinking of yourself higher than you ought to. You may think you're more important than you really are. Um, again, I go back to my neighbor, Eric's words. I think of that so many times. I am no better than anyone and no one is better than me. Like we are all equal in God's eyes. And so it's like always like I am not that important. God can do this without me. I am not that important, you know. Um, and then we should always avoid sex or self self exaltation. <laughs> Didn't come out right. <laughs> Even as we should humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Uh did I put this verse in there? I did not. Um, we should also humble ourselves before others. Now, if before an earthly prince, men should carry themselves thus modestly and humbly, how much more before the king of heaven? And if among guests at a feast, how much more among the saints and angels in the holy assemblies? I remember somebody had said one time, you can, you can, you can always look and compare yourself to somebody and look better than somebody else. But if you compare yourself to Jesus, you don't account to anything. So it's like, you know, thinking of yourself, um, just giving yourself self exaltation just does not, it, it, you, you see those people who do that and you're just like, I don't know, I cringe. I'm just like, Oh, it's going to be rough. It's going to be a rough road once you uh, see, um, but I know I do it too. So I think of that myself too. So um, religion teaches us humility and self-denial he who has seen the glory of the lord in christ jesus will feel his own unworthiness and that is so true we look at what jesus did and what jesus is and it's just there is just no way we could ever amount to to that so we just see that this world could it could i mean like we are not as as great as we think we are but we are his so we have to remember that it's like not like the think bad about yourself but we also shouldn't think ourselves so highly as like as james says so uh verse 8 and 10 frivolous litigation and divulging confidence will ruin one's reputation you'll never let live it down is literally a bad report will not return that is the person who disgraces you will ha not have to eat his words and so Jesus gave a similar teaching. Who got the Luke passage? Laura, can you read that? Luke 12, 57 through 59. Make sure I unmute there. Um, and why do you not judge for yourselves what is right? As you go with your accuser before the magistrate, make an effort to settle with him on the way, lest he drag you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and the officer put you in prison. I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the very last penny. So this is just a reason why we should avoid court. You might lose and be put to shame. Many people who go to court have an unrealistic confidence that they will win. Um, this is really, this is a really funny quote from Adam Clark, and I couldn't help but add this one. On this subject, I cannot but give the following extract from Sir John Hawkins' Life of Dr. Johnson, which he quotes from Mr. Selwyn of London. A man who deliberates about going to law should have, one, a good cause, two, a good purse, three, a good skillful, skillful attorney, four, good evidence, five, good able counsel, six, a good upright judge, seven, a good intelligent jury. And with all these on his side, if he have not, good luck. It is all odds, but he miscarries in his suit. <laughs> so basically, good luck. Um, and, you know, Adam Clark was a long time ago, so he wrote that. So I'm like, man, I wonder what you think now. Um, 
So it is really kind of crazy. You know, again, if you can avoid that as believers, we should, we should always, always try to do things out. Like we should, of course, shouldn't be the last option as believers, especially if it's another believer. Now, sometimes you can't help going to court. Sometimes you're going to go to court. Sometimes, I mean, it just happens. Um, but it's like, I feel like if you are, you're two believers and you serve the same God, you should be able to work things out. I know sometimes that is not, a, that is, um, it, you, you want it to happen, but sometimes it doesn't. But um, if you can, you know, just try. Uh, verse 11 through 12, this decorative uh, apples are not just golden in color, but are apparently made of gold. They could be spears set on a tray and images and laid into it. When a person is receptive to a wise rebuke, he is improved. Um, this is so true. I was struggling with something a few weeks ago and I texted my mentor. It was just completely honest with her. Um, she like quickly rebuked me and said that um, she gave me just a different angle. I needed to hear that. I really did. I needed to hear that I was totally wrong and I was being a little brat. Um, and if I wouldn't have went down that path and my thoughts, I shudder at the damage it would have caused in the situation. Um, it truly was hard to hear at first. And I was really kind of upset that she wasn't taking my side, honestly, but I was a little baby and I wanted her to take my side, but she was like, uh, no, nope, you're wrong, Shannon. And she was very honest. And I was like, okay, you're right. Uh, and so that whole week, she gave me a different perspective to pray for. So every time that that would come up in my head and that bitterness would come up, it would just be praying what she said to pray. She just said, you need to pray this whenever that comes to your to your mind. And it did. It changed the whole perspective. It just, it really has. It's like, oh, okay, I can pray that. Like, um, I'm going to start praying that. And it, it has it. And I really do think what damage that would have done had I gone down that route. I mean, I could have justified it. I could have easily justified it as a Christian too, but it wasn't the right, it wasn't the right justification. It was a self, self pity, I guess, more than anything. Um, so I think that is whenever it's just so good to hear. So does anybody have anything on that section? Spouses and friends, the kings and queens of gentle rebuke. <laughs> That's what it seems like to me. <laughs> Good thing we have them at times. Other times it's like, oh, why did I tell you that? Okay, that's why. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Back to refining. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. On my um, little blurb down here, it equates gold and silver to fruit of the fruit of wisdom. And so if you speak um, aptly, you know, you're speaking wisdom. You have wisdom to speak, to know what you're saying. I thought it was interesting. My version in verse 11, it says like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. I just think that like, right time, right place, yeah. right surrounding makes a really big difference, right? Heart attitude, right motives. It's just, you have to have kind of the right circumstances. You know, like when you ask your mom for something, you want to make sure she's in the right mood for it. <laughs> <laughs> my kids have not learned that. And especially my son, he'll ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. And finally, I'm like, listen, if you ask me one more time right now, the answer will be no forever. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask in a different way. <laughs> I am 47 and I'm currently living with my mom. And I received gentle rebuke this week because I put tops of strawberries in what I thought was the food recycling bin. No, 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 <laughs> that was only for coffee grounds. And the gentle rebuke that I received when I arrived on two to go put the trash down oh goodness I was like five years old again <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, mm. it also says here on that it took us took me back to like um th Genesis 318 I think that mm -hmm. is yeah where the wisdom the tree of life they ate it and got wisdom and they shouldn't have 
done that. And so um, the tree of life is a source of life. And um, so, and the fruit is better than his fruit. God's fruit is better than gold and silver. Yeah. And we'll see that. Well, we saw that last week, but we'll see that definitely in the next few days, I think, in the reading. Um, especially in Ecclesiastes 1, you're going to see that too. Maybe even in this, I don't know. I can't remember. I know I've done that. <laughs> okay, let's get to the next section. Oh, did anybody else have anything? I didn't ask that last time. Okay. Stacy, if you don't mind going 13 to 17. Okay. Like a snow cooled drink at harvest time is a trustworthy messenger to the one who sends him. He refreshes the spirit of his master. Like clouds and wind without rain is one who boasts of gifts never given. Through patience, a ruler can be persuaded and a gentle tongue can break a bone. If you find honey, just eat just enough, too much of it and you will vomit. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house. Too much of you and they will hate you. Your says they will beat you? No, they will hate you. Oh, I thought you said beat you. I was like, what? No. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> suggested. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awkward. Yeah, I know. I was like, that went down a dark path. <laughs> yeah, I they say, well, beat you, beat you. Kind of the same, but, you know, physical, <laughs> yeah. theoretical, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh verse 13 harvest time could be dangerously hot for snow to fall at harvest could be disastrous but the wealthy sometimes had it carried down from the mountains for refreshment i mean goodness like whenever i was reading writing this the heat like here was ruining our crops it was so hot yeah. here last week um and i couldn't imagine what snow would do it's like the opposite effect too i mean that would be terrible so that kind of really hit hit like reality for me there um and the circumstance we're in verse 14 this is literally a lying gift um so this is such a ver funny verse to me like um it's like you don't you boast about a gift that doesn't exist and so it's like i don't know there are some and so I looked this up and there was a, I think this is a quote. Um, there are some who give nothing, but want to be known as people who give other small gifts and want to be known as those who give great gifts, um, such as Ananias and Sapphira. I didn't put that in reading, but if you read about them, they lied and then nothing good happened with them. Um, they want the reputation of generosity without actually being generous. And this is so true because most givers I know I, they, I like, I am talking about people who like, I know people who give away their salaries. They, their complete salaries. Like they live off of, they, they live off their retirement. Like they have a retirement from their first job and then they work a second job and they give away the, all of that. Um, and they are super humble about it. And you never know, like, they don't tell anyone, like there's like one person that told me and they were like, we don't tell anyone that like, there's very few, there's not a handful of people. I thankfully was like one of them. And that was like, man, hashtag goals, you know? Um, those are who I like, I want to be like that one day. It would just be awesome. Um, but they, they don't, they don't make it known. They don't, you know, it's like the people who always want to tell you whenever they give you, Oh, I gave to that room. Like, it's like, they want themselves again, it goes back to the very first of it. They want to be exalted. And, um, you know, it's like, you know, we're not supposed to tell others when, when our left hand, our right hand, tell our left hand what our right hand is doing. Um, the short New Testament letter of Jude used this figure to describe dangerous, unproductive people. And then who got the Jude 112? Amanda, do you mind reading that? Yep. These people are dangerous reefs at your love feast as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves. They are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. So we see here again that old New Testament backing up Old Testament, and it's just backing up with what that says. Um, verse 15. Uh, let's see. Stacy, do you mind reading verses 24? We're going to kind of put that into, was it 15? Hold on. No, never mind. 
I don't know why I did that. Um, a bone is the hardest part of the person here. It represents strong resistance to persuasion. Oh yeah, yeah I do. Um, and then I, I'm going to put this in with verse 24. Um, I'll just go ahead and read that. Better to live on the corner of a roof than to share a house with a nagging wife. Um, this is true, especially in our marriages. So if we see here, a gentle tongue can break a bone. And then we see that in our marriages as well. Um, so can somebody, who got the Timothy passage? Whoever got the Timothy passage and the Titus passage, if y'all can read those. Oh, I had, it's first Timothy one, nine. Yes. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers. Then it continues. Yeah. Okay. So whoever got the Philippians, Colossians, and James, uh, that's we're going to read all those passages now. So whoever, uh, the Titus, who has the Titus? To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. Okay. And then the Philippians. Oh, that was Philippians? I thought it was. No, you're good. No, next is Philippians. Oh, okay. Philippians 2.8. Who got that? Anybody? I'll get it. I got it. <laughs> And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Okay, and then the Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then James 4, 6. But he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So be patient to bear a present hurt. Be mild to speak without passion, for persuasive language is the most effect effectual to prevail over the hardened mind. Um, this is so true. And I mean, I don't know about y'all, but this is, I think this is hardest in, in marriage than anything, you know, it's, it's, that's the person who you're closest to. And, um, so if you are married, then that's, that's hard. Um, verse 16, this is so true about anything in life, not just food. <laughs> Last night we had, um, so verse 16, where if you find honey, eat only what you need. Otherwise you'll get sick from it and vomit. Too much of a good thing is too much <laughs> of a good thing. <laughs> so last night we had, Whenever I wrote this, the Saturday night, I did this Sunday. So Saturday night, we had Bunko at church for an outreach. And by the third round, I was like, okay, I'm done rolling dice. Like, I'm just done. <laughs> you know, it was fun. It was great. The first round and the second round. But by the third, I'm like, oh, nope, we're good. Um, so when we when we scheduled it for the next time, I was like, two rounds. That's all this ADHD, ADHD girl can do. Um, okay, so verse 17. Um uh, let's see here. This kind of goes with 16 and 17. Too much of a good thing is bad. So even a good guest should exercise moderation. Seldom set foot in a, is literally make your foot precious. Um, to get sick is literally to be satisfied. So the wise man or woman will be sensitive to the sense that a neighbor may become wary of their presence. Since good neighborly relationships make life much better, that this is an important principle of wisdom. And I love this. We cannot be upon um, good terms with our neighbors without discretion as well as sincerity. How much better a friend is God than any other friend? Um, the oftener we, we come to him, the more welcome. And so the only thing that we cannot have enough of is God. Like we can never have enough of him. So like we like that's the one thing that we can be gluttonous of. We can be you know, we can do anything of his word. We can do like we can be in his word like so much and but even I think that we we would need a break. Like I remember I read this. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of the um the monk. I can't remember his name. I had his book. One of my friends gave me his book. And like he like his goal was to not sin. So every day he would write, he wrote a journal about like not sinning. And his goal was to just be in God's word all day. And he was a monk, so he could do that. Um, but then he would see that he, it, it's like, you see his emotions through that and he still sinned even in the midst of that, even, so I don't know, it's really could, 
I don't know where it's at, but it's really good. I'll have to figure out where it is, but it was really good. And so even, even with God's word, we can pertain a lot of it, but we have to have action to it. And James, it says that, I mean, we, again, that knowledge means nothing unless we share it with others. And so we should go forth and tell others about him. And we should be um, building relationships of those who don't know him. And so that way um, we can tell others about who he is and what we're learning and everything. So anybody have anything on that section? I'm just a little bit struck by verse 17 because we were without plumbing last Friday night and our neighbors graciously allowed us to use their bathroom. Well, then throughout the day, the kids were like bringing the doorbell and I'm like, let's like <laughs> be careful about this. And so then they left their house unlocked, which you can do in small town, Nebraska. They left the garage door unlocked so we could go through and just go right down into the basement and use their bathroom, which I was thankful of. But I didn't want them to become weary of us and <laughs> be like, stay out of my house. Anyway, so maybe, maybe not super applicable, but just kind of struck me today. That's totally applicable. That is, that's what we should see as a picture to the side. Please see notes from Katie. When you're <laughs> <looking for that. laughs> okay. Anybody have anything on that section? Let's get to the next. Um, Stacy, can you read 18 through 22, please? Like a club or a sword or a sharp arrow is one who gives false testimony against a neighbor. Just like a broken tooth or a lame foot is resilience on the unfaithful in a time of trouble. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a wound is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will help. You will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. Yeah, these verses are probably the main reason why I wanted to pick this chapter. Uh, verse 18, perjury against a neighbor is a de um, devastating as beating him to death with a club, which again, it goes with what you said <laughs> with uh, Stacey, how I misunderstood with beat. <laughs> so, um, but it's beating him to death with a club or opening him up with a sword or piercing him through the heart with an arrow. And I get this, um, that person could have seen that person who did you wrong, you'd have to see that person every day. Like, um, and that would be hard, you know, just remind, reminding you of that. This was from a, uh, commentary is as cruel and pernicious to him as any instrument of death. The design of proverb is to show the wickedness of slander and that a false witness in some respect as bad as murder, a false testimony is dangerous in everything. And again, this is why we do not, we do not, as believers, we do not slander people like, and that's hard for me because I will like say something like I'll read, I, I read Wikipedia all the time about people. So I think it's right. So I'm like, Oh, you know, that person did this. <gasps> I can't believe they left their wife for this, you know? And you know, it's like, I don't know that person. And does it really matter? No. Um, but it's like, you know, it, we should not slander. And then verse 19, unreliable is literally treacherous. Um, and so these two proverbs are connected because the man who bears false witness is often also the unfaithful man in the time of trouble. In one aspect, he brings pain. In the other aspect, he is a pain. The unfaithful man is useless, like a persistent, debilitating pain. Um, and I like this hit me like, you know, it's like those small things, you know, people will slander people and they'll start. It's, it's like, has, have any of y'all played the game telephone? <laughs> yeah especially with kids, you know, we did that. I remember we did that with the kids like in fourth grade and we started and we did it and it came back way completely wrong. Well, that's how slander is. That's how false witnessing, saying things about people. Whenever you say one little thing, it goes and it's excruciating, right? And that person doesn't even know you're saying it, right? Um, I had a absolute horrifically painful chip tooth last week. It was so painful and it was so bad. And um, I was counseling on Tuesday and my last client canceled and I was like, I got to call the dentist. So I called the dentist to get it fixed. And, um, it was excruciating pain. It started to where it wasn't even painful. I just knew it happened. And then it hurt a little the next day. And then the next day it hurt a little, but then by that, like the third day, it was so painful. Um, and I, the, I found out that the dentist said that the food went to my bone and so it could have actually caused a really bad infection had she not got me in um, soon. 
um, which that was a lot of drama. And so uh, that's how it happens with with slandering and with gossip. You start with something small. It may not seem like a big deal. You think it won't have any effect on you. And that's what I thought on Friday. I thought whenever I chipped my cheese, I had friends come over. My friend is actually a dental hygienist. And I said, hey, look, this this came off. And she's like, oh, okay, is it hurting? I was like, no, it's not hurting really. And and um, I didn't think it, but then it gradually got worse and worse. And it's the same thing. Whenever you start doing that, it, it gets worse and worse and you're hurting that person. Um, and so verse 20, um, here are some actions that make things worse. Cherry songs can make a troubled person worse. Pouring a vinegar on soda makes the vinegar foam. It also neutralizes both them and makes them worthless. The word translated soda could also be a deep womb. Pouring vinegar on it could bring suffering with no benefit. Um, and then verse 21 through 22, to heap coals on his head does not imply vengeance because God does not reward vengeance. Rather, it may refer to the shame an enemy feels when his assaults are met with good deeds. When I read this passage, I knew this chapter is one that I would go over because it is all about Jesus. Jesus lived out this passage on the cross. Um, Katie, can you read Luke 23, 32 through 49? Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were staring at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. The other answered and rebuked him, said, and rebuking him, said, do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Because the sun was obscured, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And Jesus, crying out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Now, when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly, this man was innocent. And all the crowds who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what had happened, began to return, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who accompanied him from Galilee were standing at a distance, seeing these things. Okay, so here we see these verses fit perfectly with verses 21 through 22. Look at the thief on the cross. And then there is the Bible commands us to have giving love and care even to our enemy. Human nature would tell us to hate our, our enemy, but the Bible tells us to love our enemies and do it practically. We see that in Matthew 5. Did somebody get that? Did I have that? 5, 44 through 47. Did somebody get that one? Yep. Give me just a second. <clears throat> 5, 44. Okay. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven. He causes his son, his son to rise on the evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not, do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. So we see that here again. Um, we're to love. Um, but isn't this so challenging as human nature? I mean, it is hard. This is one of, I feel like this is the hardest thing. And this, honestly, like I probably have mentioned this so many times, but when I was in the history of world religion class, we had this guy who made up his own religion, Ted, and he like, he wasn't even, he wasn't even in the class. He just loved Pastor Davis. <laughs> it was really crazy. And he like actually did a, like a 
paper or whatever, he spoke and he said that this is why he would never be a Christian is because you have to love your enemies. He will, he said, I will never love my enemies ever. And so, um, you know, pastor Davis is, he was so good. Oh my gosh. I love him. But he was like, um, well, I mean, God loves us and, um, we're going to get to that in a minute. So, uh, just hold that thought right there. And then, so it says, do you think that others have wronged you? Pity them, pray for them, seek them out, show them their fault, humbly and meekly wash their feet, take the moat out of their eye, seek to restore them in a spirit of meekness, remembering that you may be tempted, keep coals of loving kindness on their heads, bring them if possible into such a broken and tender frame of mind that they may seek forgiveness at your hand and God's. If you cannot act thus with all the emotions you would feel, do it because it is right and the emotion will inevitably follow. Um, the precepts to love even our enemies in the Old Testament commandment, but our Savior has shown his own great example in loving us while we were his enemies. So we have to remember we were once God's enemy. When we were not a believer, we were his enemy because we didn't follow him, right? We didn't mm -hmm. love him. We didn't, we did everything against what his word commanded. And yet he still died on the cross for our sins. He still has his arms wide open anytime we come to him. And so we as believers need to be like that with our enemies. We need to, I mean, there are times, again, I will say over and over, you cannot control other people. You cannot control their feelings. You cannot control anything that they do, but you need to be right with God in that situation. And so um, I think that that's just kind of seeing, okay, God, where is my sin in this? Where is my, where am I wrong in this? And you may not be, you may not have sinned like Job. Like, you know, you look at Job, his friends all blamed him for, and he didn't sin. He was, it was the opposite. Like God was like, no, he was righteous. You know, that's why he got, he had to go through that. And so there may be those times where you didn't do anything wrong, but you still have to forgive and leave them at the feet. Again, put him in Jesus jail. Just let Jesus have the key. You just put them there and you don't have to have anything to do with them. You do not have to be a foot mat, uh, or a, a doormat. Um, you do not have to continue to be in relationship with them, but you can forgive them. You can lay them at Jesus's feet. You can let Jesus have the, um, he's the one that can have the vengeance because he says, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord, not you. Your vengeance is not, your vengeance is more like of a sinful vengeance and Jesus's vengeance is a pure vengeance. It is a righteous vengeance. And he, he knows what you don't. And sometimes by you just showing that forgiveness, by you being kind to them, even though they hurt you, what if that wins them to Christ? What if that plants a seed so much that they surrender to God? Isn't that worth it? Isn't it worth that kind of pain and, and suffering? So that's what I keep on thinking, like with the situation we're in right now, I'm just like, if this means that we have to go through this for Christ to be exalted, then praise the Lord. I will go through it because that's, that's what I want more than anything It's for them to come to Christ. And, um, and again, a lot of the times that you're dealing with people, they're not believers and you can't expect non-believers to act like a believer. And so they don't have the Holy spirit. So therefore they're not going to do what your what the word of God says. Um, and so we have to remember to give grace. Um, they don't know God. So they're, why would they not act selfish and, why would they not act self-exalting? Why would they not? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. So that's why we pray for them to know God and to come to know Christ. Um, and in that, hopefully humility, our humility will come. Um, but that is just, this is so important as Christians, but it is, I feel like it is the hardest. Like Ted, it's like a lot of people will not turn to God because of that. I mean, Ted was honest at least. Um, and he was real because he didn't want to forgive people who hurt him. Um, and I think that that is a lot of the times whenever we, when we have that, we are hurting only ourselves. Um, it's just like, I think Stacy had said one time, if you drink poison, expecting the other person to die, you know, it's like, I mean, that's what you're doing. Does anybody have anything on that section? I know we're going over, so. I've heard from a couple places that the heaping coals of fire on their head had something more to do with like an actual, uh, like if their fires went out, they often had to go try to find coals from someone else's fire to restart their fire. It was such a big life-giving thing at the time. 
And so then it was, people would come and be like, can I have some coals from your fire to start a fire for myself? And they'd carry it in pots on their head, you know, anyway, I don't know. That's about all I know about it. And it may not be like, I don't know. Um, but I've seen it a couple different places that that was the actually physically helping them out, not dumping fire on their head, which sounds much more satisfying sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was actually like helping them to build their fire back up and like nourish their family and keep their family warm and whatever. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, I think it is. It's like the reality of it is, is like, I always tell you, I told y'all if I die and my family finds my journals, I hope they burn them. I don't want them to read it. They can only read my PPP journals, but not my personal journals because I'm like, oh, I just don't like those. And it's just so evil. It just shows my real heart. But then by the end of it, it's like God's word comes in and like I feel really bad that I feel that way you know you gotta be real God knows your heart um he knows how you feel but it's it's the end result end game that matters <laughs> wouldn't it be interesting if uh because when I think of heaping burning coals on somebody's head I also get the image in Acts where uh the Holy Spirit was a flame of fire upon their head and it's like maybe that is what we're doing is by forgiving that person and they turn to Christ, they will experience the Holy Spirit. That would be really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and finish it off. Uh, Stacey, can you read 23 through 28? Like a north wind that brings unexpected rain is a sly tongue, which provokes a horrified look. Better to live on a corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. Like cold water to a weary soul is good news from a distant land. Like a muddied spring or a polluted well are the righteous who give way to the wicked. It is not good to eat too much honey, nor is it honorable to search out matters that are too deep. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Okay, so... Verse 23, in Palestine, rain actually comes from the west. North maybe suggests that the cold wind that accompanies rain. Also, north comes from a word that means hidden, which is a pun on backbiting. The second half is ambiguous in Hebrew and could be reversed in angry looks, a backbiting tongue. Um, those who speak ill of others with a backbiting tongue will provoke an angry continence in others. This is a matter of cause and effect, just like the north wind bringing forth rain. Um, 24, we went over that already. Um, and then verse 25, when we receive good news, especially from a far country, it brings great and life refreshment. This applies to good news of many types, not, not the least is the gospel, the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ to rescue all who put their trust in him. Yeah. I love that. I love whenever we hear from our missionaries that we're supporting and how God is working in them and, it's just, it, it does not just bring you so much joy. I mean, like, I know PPP, we support missionaries, um, like a, a percentage of what PPP makes goes towards missionaries. And lately at our um, team meetings, we've had those missionaries come and just say what it, they're doing. And it has just been really cool just to see a glimpse of all the work that's going towards that. It's really cool. Um, and just what God is doing all over the world. We're so confined to the U S that we don't see what's going on in, all over. And I think it's like every time, like even when we went to Ecuador in the summer, it's like God is doing such amazing things. They're, they're going through hardship. They're going through a hard time, especially now because they're, they're going through crazy. And so um, it's like, but God is still in the midst of that because people are on the ground and they're giving the good news. They're giving the gospel. So no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going through, you have Christ. And that is, that is what we put our hope and trust in. Um, verse 26, finding a well to be polluted could be disastrous to a traveler in Palestine when a righteous person, a supposed fountain of life betrays those who trust in him. It can be disastrous. Uh, if you've ever felt this way, betrayed by someone you trusted, it hurts. And in sometimes something you really need to work through of healing and forgiving, it is not, you have to go through the grieving process. I, I, I think people tend to forget that you would put the big super S on your chest and you think you're super Christian and you have to grieve, you have to forgive, you have to heal. Um, and it's just, it's just something you have, it's not going to happen overnight, but with God, all things are possible. Um, I always think of the Matthew West song, um, forgiveness, 
that song was written by a lady who forgave the man who killed her son in a car accident because he was drinking and driving. And now she goes on tour with Matthew West with the boy who killed her son and talks about forgiveness and how she had, to, she forgave him. And that's where the song forgiveness came from through Matthew West. So if she can forgive that, then like, I think of that and it's just, it's just so crazy. Um, like what I, what I think of what I got, I haven't gone through that. Like that is, that is, that would be hard. Um, but that is, that's why, you know, it's like, we have that and we're just like, okay, Jesus forgave the people on the cross. Like he, he it's just things that we have to hold on to. Um, sometimes it is true that a righteous man stumbles and falters. This is always sad, but even more so when it happens before the wicked in the view of those who reject God and his wisdom, the gross wickedness of the ungodly passes in silence, but Satan makes the neighboring ring with the failings of those who profess to be Christians. Um, and that's so true. Um, whenever, what's the first thing that whenever there is a huge mega pastor that fails infidelity or anything that is all over the news everywhere everyone wants to proclaim that and tell you how a, a pastor failed but no one will ever tell you when that pastor led 10 people to christ and and planted the seeds to where god watered and growed it and what happened they're not going to proclaim that but they are going to talk about how that christian mm -hmm. failed um verse 27 the second line is difficult it could mean and to investigate matters that are too witty and is not honorable um Glory can be a good thing, and it is part of God's promise to the believer, Romans 8, 18. Yet to seek one's own glory is not good. It is not glory at all. We should seek God's glory and not worry about our own glory. Much honey produces nausea, so evidently does self-glorification. <laughs> we must be through grace, um, dead to the pleasure of sense, and also to the praises of men. And then verse 28, um, this is so true, walk away. Like, you know, a person who does not control his temper is like a city whose wall is broken down. Walk away is the best. Just walk away rather than allow anger to overtake you and cause you to sin in it. The world, the flesh, and the devil rule over such people and not the spirit of the self-control that is part of the fruit of the spirit in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Um, and I'm going to end with this because it was so good and so true. The man who has no command over his anger is easily robbed of peace. Let us give up ourselves to the Lord and pray him to put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his statutes. The world is going to tell us one thing. The world is going to tell us we have every right to live in bondage, every right to live in unforgiveness, every right to hold that grudge. The world is going to tell us we have all the rights to do all these things, but the world does not matter. What matters is what God's word says. And what God's word says is to walk in his ways and his statutes. And he didn't expect you to do it without living that. And that's what he did on the cross. And Jesus proved that um, time and time again throughout his life on this earth. So does anybody have anything on that last section? With all the doom and gloom out there, I don't know. I would really like an email that came from PPP saying that, you know, what you guys are doing with it and the missionaries you're supporting. I mean, I think that would be a rad newsletter, even if it's not, you know, maybe it's a quarterly update or something, but I think that would, it would just be nice to read something happy. I know? think we do that on Giving Tuesday, um, but there are some missionaries that we can't do that with because there are some that you can't tell them where they're at. Well, no, no, no. I meant just more of a vague, you can keep it vague to protect everybody, okay. but like, you know, mm -hmm. your your dollars have provided and then just kind of take what it has done and send that. I think that at least for the, which I'm assuming most of the fellow, most of the fellowship, good Lord, most of the readership is Christian. They would appreciate seeing that and charitable works. Even if you're not a believer, charitable works seem to be something that across the board, everybody appreciates. Yeah. That, that would be a cool thing to, to yes. send out because, you know, everybody picks where they spend their money. And I don't know about you, but yeah, if I know that buying something, not only mm -hmm. obviously tangibly, it gives you something obviously, but you know, if it's going to benefit so many others, I'm more likely to support that company than, you know, because I didn't know PPP so did that. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've, I've never that. heard that before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Lori is the, don't let your light, right hand know what your left hand is, but it's on our about page. If you go on our about page, it shows you, it, it tells you that. Mm -hmm. Or maybe just, I'll be selfish for a minute, maybe just update the Digging Deep group. <laughs> Perks of membership. Yeah. I think that would be cool to know. 
but yes, exactly. That's exactly Lori right there. She wouldn't want to brag about it. Mm. Oh, oh. Mm -mm. Anybody have anything? I get to take my aunt out for her birthday today. So I'm really excited. My mom and my sister and me and taking my aunt out. So where are y'all going? What are you going to do? We are going to go eat at Mellow Mushroom. Do y'all have Mellow Mushroom in California? Mm -mm. No. That would be a no. It's a hipster it's, pizza oh, place. It's fun and interesting. That would be a no. <laughs> we have 27 Hi, of everything else that you know Hi, Amanda hey yeah it's a really interesting restaurant the pizza is amazing absolutely it's yeah. so hipster it's very hipster <laughs> yeah. it's been a long and time. why in the world don't we have it I know that's why I'm surprised y'all know it I'm like it's so California <laughs> so well that that's that saying takes on a whole other meaning here in California, so we're just going to leave that alone for now. Okay, then. <laughs> yeah. Karen picked up what I was putting down. Okay. So, Cassie, Casey, 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 where do you live? I live in Houston, Texas. Oh, okay. Good. So, you, you said yes to Mellow Mushroom. Y'all have a pretty hipster place. Yeah, I used to live in North Carolina, so I know it's out there, but I'm not sure exactly if it's in Texas or not. It's but not in it's Texas. Good. I've never heard of it before. So oh, okay. We yeah, used to go there for lunch because the lunches were like before the pandemic anyway, like five dollars or something like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It's my aunt's favorite. And so she's really she's really, she doesn't have daughters. So me and my sister kind of she has only sons, so she didn't have that daughter mom relationship and she like lives like two minutes away from me so I uh I enjoy just spending time with her so reminded me in the tagline for today it said it might ruffle some feathers speaking of feathers what happened with your chicken project girl let me tell you I am too busy to fight the city council guy but oh. I have not stopped in my mind I have told everyone and everyone just keeps on telling me to get chickens and I am if I can talk my husband into doing it he's such a law follower like I don't know why <laughs> I mean, even the cop told me to go get them. So he was like, just go get the chickens. And I'm like, thank you. Like, can you go talk to my, my husband? Um, so yeah, I still, that city council guy, he's still in the back of my mind. I am not, but I'm just too busy. I, I told my husband, I just need to quit my job so I can go fight all these causes. And so I'm like, I need to go fight all these causes. There's so many causes to fight. And this is one of them. I want to go like, justice. I want to go to that city council, me, that city council's guy office every day and be like, you're going to see me every day until you give me my chickens. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get them. Well, what oh, is yeah. the reason for not having chicken? What if they, why not? Why do you not? He didn't give me a reason, Vale. That's what frustrates me. He gave me here. I'm turning off. Didn't my he give recording. you some cockamamie thing?